What'd you do at work today? Did you talk to any A-list celebrities or get paid to watch television? Well, if not, then you're definitely not as cool as today's guests. This is the Infatuation Podcast, and today we'll be talking with someone who has been interviewing and reporting on television and movies for literally her entire adult life. She interviews all the top Hollywood stars on behalf of the Made in Hollywood show, and reports daily on the best of last night's television programs for Yahoo Entertainment. Today, we're talking with on-air host, producer, and senior writer, Kylie Erica Marr. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Welcome back to... The podcast. Uh, hope you're doing great out there. Are you guys ready to talk a little Hollywood and maybe a little nighttime television or what it's like to be an Asian American in the entertainment industry? Well, we have the perfect guest for us today. We have on air host, producer, and writer Kylie Erica Marr. Hey, Kylie. Hey, guys. So happy to be here. Yeah, we're so excited. You know, to be honest, I was surprised that you replied to my message. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, you're, I, I think of you as pretty big. Like, you're, you've interviewed everyone, and I, I thought, I'll just take a chance. Oh, my gosh, Kylie. that's so funny. Well, actually, one of my biggest things, and I think a big reason why I've gotten to where I am today, and one of the biggest piece of advice that I give to people is to never think that you're too big or you're too good enough. Mm. Just stay humble. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So I was like, whoa, she replied. What's going <laughs> on here? <laughs> But uh, yeah, because I've been using e- I've been using Yahoo as my homepage since the '90s. So I so I've seen you, um, you know, just on Yahoo Entertainment, which is one of the best parts of Yahoo. Have to say, you know, Yahoo Thank Finance, you. Yahoo Entertainment, and so yeah, I've seen you around. So I was like, oh, I'll just, and then I saw you on Instagram. I was like, oh, I'll just I'll shoot I'll shoot her an email, see what happens, and here you are. Uh, and you're in Los Angeles right now. Yes. What's good in LA right now? Nothing because there's a heat wave <laughs> oh, and no. I'm already trying to figure out where I'm going out of town this weekend to escape it. It's like 110 degrees every single day this week. Where are you based? We're in San Francisco. Come on up. It's like 63 right now. Oh my God. It's it's actually 109 degrees, I think, right now, or 107. <laughs> and yeah. I, I'm looking, let me see. It's 102 degrees, four o'clock in the e- early evening, but yeah, all the yeah. rest of the week, 103, 109, 110, like no, just yeah. awful. So no, ch- now, now look up San Francisco. It's going to be sixties and seventies all week. Let's long. see. <laughs> Guarantee. I'm going to bet you on this one. San Francisco, yeah, it's 67 degrees and your, <laughs> your highest where it's like 110 for me this weekend, you guys, you tap out at 78. Whoa, that's hot for us. <laughs> that's like, I haven't seen 78 degrees up here since April. That's sweater weather for you. <laughs> I know, well, because I moved to the valley too. So oh, it's extra yeah. hot. It's 30 <laughs> degrees hotter than I used to live in Marina Del Rey and I moved. So I kept the weather in my app because I like, I always like dream about still being in Marina Del Rey and every day it's a 30 degrees cooler and I'm just like so <laughs> depressed. Up Why here. did I do this to I know. myself? <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about you. So uh, are you a SoCal girl born yes. and raised? Born and raised. Um, I was born in West Covina, grew up in Roland Heights, just kind of like the Asian air, one of the Asian areas <laughs> here in yeah. LA County. And went to high school in Fullerton, went to college in Long Beach. Then wow, you really, you really never left. <laughs> never left. I will, we'll, we'll get into this, but because I graduated high school so early and went to college so early, my dad imposed this rule where I couldn't <laughs> apply to colleges that weren't within 40 minutes of driving. <laughs> that way, if anything happened, he could like easily get to me. Yeah, I, I get, I get it. I got a couple girls. I get it. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> what were you like as a kid? Were you were you more of a tomboy or were you more of a girly girl? I was actually more of a girly girl, which okay. is funny. Like you, I think I still have a lot of like, I still have a feminine side. But if you were to look at my Instagram, for those who don't know me, would assume that I am a little bit more tomboyish because I my style now is definitely a little bit more masculine. But I definitely was into dance, gymnastics. I was a cheerleader. Uh, so I did all the girly, I was a girl scout, all the girly things. <laughs> you checked all the boxes. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. 
Do you know Do you know much about your family background, like your ancestors, where they came from, and why they came here? My dad's side, my paternal side, his dad, so my grandpa and grandma, moved here from China. And I think some of them were in Hong Kong. I don't remember where else in China. But when I went to Hong Kong, we visited like my great, great, great grandma's apartment. Uh-huh. But they came here first. And so my dad was born here in the States. On my mom's side, my grandma was born and raised in Hawaii and all yeah. her siblings. And I believe her parents came here from China. But okay. my grandma was in China during Pearl Harbor. Oh, wow. So growing up, she would tell us all the different stories of having to paint the windows black so oh, that wow. way the airplanes at night wouldn't see your place and bomb you because the lights were on. And she had wow. to also wear like the pin that said, I'm Chinese. So that way that you wouldn't be yeah. mistaken for being Japanese. Yeah, my dad too, because my dad grew up in Denver and they had a camp over there. Uh, one of the internment camps. And so he had a, I'm Chinese, not Japanese. That's crazy. I know. I so nuts. And you know, like, I don't know about you, but my Asian family, they're like hoarders. They keep <laughs> things. So yeah, I'm like, yeah. my grandma for sure kept that I'm Chinese button somewhere. So we're going to have to like turn the house upside down yeah. eventually and try to find that button. Yeah, it's it's a sad memento, but it's it's kind of it's just a good reminder that, mm-hmm. you know, this, <laughs> things, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and so I heard a rumor that you were like a childhood actor, like at, like you were four years old doing, do you remember what you I was did? three. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I remember. And it, it wasn't my mom putting me into things. People think that like, it was my mom who made me do this, but it was all me. I, I don't <laughs> specifically remember this moment, but she tells me all the time and tells other people that I was three years old. I just walked up to her one day at home and was like, mom, I want to see myself in magazines and on TV. (laughs) And that's just what I said. And she Uh was like, okay, Kylie, like, well, that's not easy. So Uh I hope you know, like, it's a great dream, but like, it may not happen. There's a lot that goes into that. Like she, like Google, like I said, the internet didn't exist. So she had to like go into the yellow pages and try to find a (laughs) talent talent scout manager (laughs) or like, or like, or every week, I guess, like there would be castings in the newspaper. And so she right, would take right. castings. Um, but yeah, so that's how it started. I was three years old. By the age of four, I had gotten myself an acting manager with my mother's help, obviously. And then I had different agents for all the different departments. So I did like theatrical, film, print, voiceover work, and like everything. I had a different agent for each thing. And I would just go on auditions every single week with my mom after school. Yeah. And none of this runs in your family. It was just all pretty much you wanting to do this. Yes, <laughs> entirely. Yeah. Are there VHS tapes of this? Yes. Can, we find, can we find some of this? <laughs> because back in the day when I would get a role, like I had guest roles on shows like Seventh Heaven or ER, uh, DVR didn't exist. So, yeah, yeah. so we would we would notate like they would let us know when the episode was going to air and we would put the VHS tape inside and record uh, onto a VHS, my appearance on the show, which <laughs> is so funny because now you can go on Hulu and like watch Seventh Heaven. So I was able to find myself. I, there was never a need to actually record it on v, on a VHS because right. it just lives. Yeah, on- but you never, you didn't know there'd be the streaming services. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is cool. That is cool. So you got to find someone, put it on the internet. I think we need to see. Uh, I, I have actually shared it. Not, I didn't put it on YouTube, but I had shared it to my story. Uh, <laughs> myself on Seventh Heaven and myself on ER. That's very cool. Very cool. So it turns out that you're also a genius. How, <laughs> is it true that you're like a mini Doogie Hauser and you graduated high school when you're like 16 years old? Yes. I skipped two grades. I started a year early, first off. So I, when I was, I was already a full year younger when I started kindergarten and then I skipped kindergarten. And I actually Uh do remember this. I, I don't remember all the details. My mom says that my teacher Kate like called her in one day and was like, Kylie's just really bored. She's so bored Uh in my class. And, and I get this, (laughs) I don't remember doing this, but it sounds like something I would do. I guess I was so (laughs) offended 
by how easy the work was <laughs> that I was intentionally doing it very sloppily. And so like, like I was be bothered. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like if it was like circle all the red lobsters, I was like, oh, and so I would like, I would like be like, you could tell by the way, I guess I was circling it that my teacher could tell that I was annoyed that I had to do it. And so she called my mom in and said, Kylie is just really bored. Uh, like, it just seems like this is all just way too easy for her. And, sh- and we want to see if she would do well in the next grade up. And so I rem- I do remember this moment where they called me into the room and they said, how would you feel about going into this class? And I had a crush on a kid named <laughs> Adrian who was okay. in that first grade class. And I thought, yeah, because if this I go to that class, <laughs> <laughs> I can like hang out with that, that boy, Adrian. So I was like crushing at the age of like, I don't know, four. I already had a boy crush. Okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes that's what it takes to get you motivated to do something. I know. So, <laughs> so it ended up working out that I turned 16 halfway through my senior year of high school. So I wasn't even able to drive until halfway through my last year of high school. And then, you, yes, went to college at 16. You couldn't even get a credit card. You couldn't go to like an 18 and under, 18 and over club or anything. No, nope. no. <laughs> I had, do you remember like back in the day, they had these things called like Visa Bucks or something, where it was like yeah. a prepaid card to teach kids how to use a credit card. Right, my right. parents would just put up like 20 bucks on it a month. <laughs> That's what I had. <laughs> oh, man. But- so I think it's pretty obvious you could have done almost anything, right? If you wanted to try to get medical school, you could have, except for oh, the yeah. frog dissection part. I thought <laughs> I was going to be a lawyer, actually. Uh, I had taken a break from acting uh, when I started high school. I wanted to have more. I actually, so the truth is, and I don't always tell people this much detail into the truth of this story, but since we are talking about being Asian in mm-hmm. the entertainment industry and how hard it is and especially was back then, the truth is, is that there was a time between I started acting really like heavily between four and 12. But towards those later years, it was harder for me to get roles because I wasn't getting the Asian roles, which weren't that many because I didn't look Asian enough, <laughs> but I wouldn't get any of the other roles because I wasn't white. So I would yeah. only go out, I would only get auditions for the roles where it was specifically like an Asian orphan that was adopted into this white family or which is, the, I actually did get that role. <laughs> and, <laughs> or it was like generally like some sort of ethnicity. But if it was like the lead role in something, it they always wanted someone white for the role. Yeah. So as I got older, it started getting a little bit harder to get these roles. And I wasn't booking as many things, which started to kind of like the rejection did start kind of taking its toll mm-hmm. on me. Whereas like when I was younger and I was like five or six, I didn't care. But when you're starting right. to get to the age of like 12 and like your hormones are creeping up soon, that mm-hmm. starts to personally get to you a little bit more. And then I just wanted to have a normal high school experience because I was bullied in junior high for being able to take time off from school to go film something. When I would come Uh, back, people, the kids like resented me for that. So then they were like really mean to me. So I just like wanted, it just, it was all a lot. So I just wanted to go to a normal high school, not be bullied. Um, And then, and also like not have any more rejection. I like tested to go to Troy, which was this math and science technology magnet school where I knew Mm -hmm. they were all like smart nerds. So everyone, (laughs) so like no one would be like, I wouldn't stick out. I just didn't want to stand out anymore. Yeah. I mean, you're already two years younger than everyone too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And like that actually starts being hard socially too, especially in high school, because when people are teenagers, you're still 12 or when they're starting to drive, you're still 14. Um, and so that going to Troy led me onto this path of thinking I was going to become a lawyer. I was going to graduate and go to business school and law school, but ultimately I obviously found my way back to where I'm supposed to be. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So what, what flipped that switch? You, you were in college, you started working too, right? You started to do more on air stuff. Well, what happened was I went to school for business marketing, Long Beach state. I was studying business marketing. And after my first year of all the different classes and business classes, I realized, oh, no, this is not what I want to do. I do not. 
<laughs> enjoy yeah. this. I actually, I did a law firm or an, an internship at a law firm first in high school. It was like something that we had to do for Troy. So in sure. between my okay. junior and senior year, we ha- you have to do an internship for what you think your career is going to be. That's when I decided I was never going to be a lawyer anymore. <laughs> Not going to happen. Yeah, I was like falling asleep on the job. Like right, <laughs> they, would, right. they, they would be like having me on a typewriter typing affidavits and I would like straight up just like fall asleep when they weren't looking. And I'm like, okay, yeah. not going to be a lawyer. Not be a lawyer. <laughs> so then I was going to go to business school for marketing, which I did. I got my degree and everything. But after my first year, I'm just like, no, I just, something in me is telling me I always knew that I wanted to be in front of the camera and I wanted to do something within the entertainment industry. I always knew that since I was three years old and it just was calling me. So like I had taken enough time off that I was like, I just, I really want to go back and I want to do that again. And I, I had regretted taking the time off. So I went back to my acting manager and he was like, well, you took too many years off. You took Mm -hmm. four years off. No one knows you anymore. Cause before the casting directors, they all generally know you. Um, And he's like, you took too much time off. You can't just get back into it anymore. So he has started this show made in Hollywood. Oh, okay. He was the creator of it. He's the CEO of the company um, and the EP of the show. And at that time, that's when like Ryan Seacrest and Juliana Rancic were starting to mm-hmm. host E. So like being an on-camera host was becoming more popular, whereas before it was really just news reporters. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, these media outlets are starting to use people on camera for these press junkets, whereas before they didn't really do that. And he's like, do you want to try doing it? Because he had just been doing the interviews, not on camera. So uh-huh. I was like, okay. So literally like my first chunk it was like, I was just like thrown into the craziest first junket. Like it wasn't just a walk in the park. It could have just been like a really easy, like typical one going to a hotel, sitting down and doing like a five minute interview. But no, I had to go to Universal Studios where I interviewed the director, but then I got into a car and had to interview the driver while doing a stunt drive, like <laughs> drifting. And then I also had to do what we call stand up. So that's where like you're standing with a microphone being like, hi, I'm Kylie Mar from Made in Hollywood. We're live here at Universal Studios for and we're interviewing Justin Lin. And I didn't I didn't know any of that. He was like, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to do what? I'm going to do, I'm going to do jokes, stand up joke, like, like comedy. And he's like, no, you're going to do stand up. It means you stand there with a microphone and you tell everyone what you're doing. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Like I didn't <laughs> understand. I had no idea. And he's like, say and it. You're like, so and I you're like 18 right now. You're 18. And you're I was 17. Holy I was 17 yeah, and yeah. I had no idea what I was supposed to say, where to go, what I was supposed to do. I was just so lost. And I can't believe, and like, that is like doing all three things like that, like an interview, but also stand-ups, but also like an interview while you're doing a stunt. Like that's (laughs) something that you, we, we later do as reporters often, but not for your like first time ever experiencing it. So it was crazy. And I told you minor. that this was going to be a long podcast because I have stories and it goes on for a long time. That's why we're here, man. <laughs> <laughs> I warned <That's>, you. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm glad to do it. I got, you know, I can record as long as you have time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the, the, this is the gig that you're still doing. Yes. That's where we started. Sorry. I got off on a tangent. So no, no. yeah, my second year of college, it was before my second year of college, I started doing interviews And then it kind of just started taking off and I was doing a lot of interviews. I was going to screenings and junkets throughout the week and every weekend. And so I would have to like skip my night classes, but I realized (laughs) I did, I, I did this intentionally thinking I was going to get back into acting. So it was Mm -hmm. just going to be a stepping stone to get me my name out there again. And then I, I wasn't supposed to do hosting or reporting for longer than a couple years max. Right. Right. Um, But I ended up falling in love with hosting just through practicing and trying to perfect the skill. I ended up falling in love with it. And so I was still studying business marketing. I wanted to, I still wanted to get my degree just in case, because you never know in this industry, nothing's promised. My career could end tomorrow and you want to have, and our Asian parents are like, we'll have this backup, you know? So (laughs) I would have to tell my teachers for my night classes, like, look, 
I already found what I want to be my career. It has nothing to do with this, but like I explained them the circumstances and I'm like, this is a really great job and I don't want to lose it. This is what I want to do once I'm, once I graduate and they all understood. So my teachers would always let me take, do like makeup tests and miss class whenever I needed. Like luckily <laughs> everyone was like really understanding about it. So I managed to just like juggle still trying to finish college while also starting Made in Hollywood. And yeah, I still do it years later. Yeah. Uh. And and so so this gig has led you. It, it's pretty much in in L. A. in Hollywood that you're doing these things. But you get to go to junkets. You get to do interviews. So for for those of us who don't really know what a junket is, uh, describe what a junket is. It's- They're so fun. <laughs> <laughs> really though. Okay, so a junket is what happens when a movie is coming out. What the studio does generally, it takes place at, for example, the Four Seasons in Los Angeles. Um, usually most of them are in Los Angeles. So they'll fly reporters from all around the country or even international reporters. They put them up at the hotel. If you live in LA, like myself, you don't get to stay at the hotel, obviously, but they put them up in a hotel for like one night. They fly them in that night. You watch the screenings. You go to a theater nearby, you see the movie ahead of time. And then the next morning you wake up and you have Um, interviews with the cast it'll be like usually I would say anywhere from like one to five rooms so it could be like two rooms or it could be or if it was like a Disney Marvel movie then it's like 10 rooms but they have rooms and it's just the hotel rooms and they have chairs outside of the hotel rooms you wait in line like a little circuit so it's like a junk (laughs) circuit And you go, you take turns going through each room. And once you go inside, you sit down in, uh, there's two chairs, you and the actor in the cameras. You have five minutes. That's it. You don't have any more than that. Like as soon as you sit down, the timer is going. So you're already asked, there's no breaking the ice. Like you just have to just have everything ready. And as soon as the five minutes is done, like they're wrapping you, like you're done. Like you can't keep Uh going if you want to. So it's really hard to get the content that you need and to be able to like, have a moment um and then yeah and then but it's really fun because also like junk reporters know we love junk it's because there's the hospitality room with free food <laughs> so <laughs> and do you have all your buddies now like you've been doing yeah. it for so long like, you know everybody right? well pre pre-covid on top of most of the junkets would happen in la every week but like at least three times out of the month we're also traveling so junkets also happen in New York or they happen in London because if it's a movie that uh-huh. a lot of the cast lives in London, they it's more they would just fly the reporters to London instead of flying the cast or same with New York. Or if it's a big movie like Mission Impossible or um, like Jurassic Park, they fly us to where the movie was filmed because they want to get on the reporter's <laughs> good side. That way we'll promote their movie. It's all part of their marketing plan, you know? So yeah, Jurassic yeah. World movies always took place in Hawaii at Kualoa Ranch where they would film the movie and yeah. or Mission Impossible in Paris or Rio and Rio de Janeiro because it like creates this like cool scene for our footage that we're then going to take home and package but we would also do fun activities. So like I've gone hang gliding over Rio de Janeiro (laughs) or I've like done archery in Scotland for the movie Brave. And so by doing me in Hollywood for, I mean, 16 years, about 14 of those years without COVID, um, I got to travel all around the world. And we're just Uh, like, we're so spoiled because it's all paid for by the (laughs) studio too. Yeah. So it literally, it's like a dream job. If you guys are into movies and you want to travel for free, that's it. Yeah. No, I, I think it'd be really hard to be your friend because it would be like, so, you know, this really cool thing happened to work. What'd you do? And you're like, oh, I hung out with Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt <laughs> in Rio yeah, or in actually, Hawaii. Yeah, that did happen to me recently when I had done the bullet train thing. It was like, what are you, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, oh, I'm about to go interview Tom, Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah. So no matter what your friends come up with that they think is really cool, they're never going to top you. Oh, I still have cool friends. <laughs> Made in Hollywood. My first question is for Mr. Brad Pitt. Your character in the film, Ladybug, believes he's very unlucky, but some would say that he's actually pretty lucky for surviving everything despite things going awry. And it's really just all about perspective. So what's your perspective on Ladybug? 
Uh, I think you just nailed it. <laughs> you just, You're welcome. Thank you, I, thank you very much. That was so easy. He tries to change all his missions by taking this like very peaceful approach. In real life, how does Brad Pitt maintain peace in his life? He's got some lovely friends that try to stay in nature, try to stay creative, just relax. It takes a village to, to raise a Brad Pitt. You gotta make sure that he's oh. centered. You wanna make sure he's taking his vitamins. You wanna make sure. <laughs> Wait, know. so are you saying that everyone was accountable for him when you were filming this movie? We really were there for him, man. Yeah. He's incredibly needy, so you have to. <laughs> I'm a delicate, delicate <laughs> flower, and it's in my contract. It's in his contract, it's in his writer. Wow, why does that not even surprise me? <laughs> So have you, so I saw, I've seen a couple of these and you've been doing so many that it's kind of find, hard to find them all, but I've seen you. So I saw you do the Star Wars Force Awakens. Yes. And I actually think, I think I saw you get the cast to sing the Star Wars song. Yeah. So with Star Wars and Marvel movies, they are so secretive. As we all know, like even the right. cast doesn't even get to like say anything or they don't even get the full scripts. But once we see the movie, they they're so like paranoid about spoilers um, that we can't even really ask the cast anything because the, also the cast isn't allowed to say anything because uh -huh. they're so tight lipped. So it's kind of like like they it's actually crazy. Like you would just ask something about their like even the most basic question. And it's almost like they wouldn't answer. Like yeah, they don't even want to answer yeah. about who their character is almost like, or it's just like some canned answer that you're going to see across a hundred interviews. So at a certain point I started being like, okay, well, what can I do that's different? Because there's nothing yeah. to ask them because they're not going to answer anything about the movie. You can't even ask about the movie. And I'm not going to ask the same question that a hundred other people are asking. So Obviously, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. When I got to do Force Awakens, I'm like, okay, what can I do that's different? So I wanted to, I had gotten this idea that I wanted them to each try to sing the theme song. I could stitch it together and it could be this montage that I like knew would probably go viral on YouTube. But yeah. we did post it. Made in Hollywood doesn't have like a huge, huge audience online. Mm -hmm. And it did do well. But like a week or two later, Jimmy Fallon did yeah. it. And yeah. I was like, that's my idea. Because <laughs> we posted it first. Uh -huh, we posted uh -huh. it before he did. And I'm like, straight up, I think one of his writers saw my video and was like, oh, we can bury this because Fallon has a bigger audience. And that's what happened. <laughs> Man, freaking Fallon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you almost got Harrison Ford to do it. I was pretty, I was pretty impressed that he's, he's a little awkward, right? I've heard he's a little... Difficult in interviews at times. He's just really serious. Him yeah. and like the Rob Robert De Niro and Tommy Lee Jones are known to be very serious. They're not going to play your games and um, they're a little bit tougher on you. I Harrison Ford, I'm not sure, but I know for sure Tommy Lee Jones is known to like call out reporters if they mm. have anything wrong or if they're or if they're just not smart. <laughs> He'll call uh -huh. them out yeah. um, and give reporters a hard time. So I, I thought he was gonna. I thought Harrison Ford would do it at one point. I almost thought I got him, and then he. But it ended up being a funny moment. It was yeah, no, it was cute. It was yeah. really cute. He made you sing it, I, <laughs> and then he goes, "Well, that's the best thing." Yeah, yeah he so. wasn't. He wasn't an ass about it. So no, he was cool. Yeah, yeah. no, he was cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're right on the pitch, and uh, and I don't want to spoil it. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked it, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe and to watch my next. And then for the next movie, you got them to do poor imitation. I know. I was like, okay, well, I, I did the song last time. I'm not going to do that again. What can I do this time? <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, so you, that one was pretty good too. Yeah, so you got Mark Hamill, you I got did. Luke Skywalker himself to do a porn. <laughs> I know, I, yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, so are there are there any instances where where you know these these folks have been they do it like six hours like a junket is what six hours long or it's not all day long? Yeah, right? they're like all day, and then it's not. They also do 
it across the country too. So they'll do a press day in LA, but they may also do a half day in New York and then they'll do one internationally sometimes too. So they're, and then also like the premiere carpet. So they're getting interviewed for one movie yeah. hun- hundreds of times. Yeah answering the same question. So do, yeah. you, do you think to yourself, okay, well, what can I, are you thinking on your feet or do you have a lot of stuff prepared and kind of I generally, yeah. So I will write questions ahead of time, obviously. And I will have that kind of like outlined before I go into the room. But then once I get into the room, I'll just have that kind of as like a backup because I have had moments like when I first was starting out that like it was just was like dead dead space where like I was like oh what do I ask next and I know I only have five minutes and I'm like killing time so I like to have these like straight questions and also just specific content that I know I need for the piece like made in Hollywood is specifically how movies are made so there are Mm. certain questions and things that I need to have that made in Hollywood could use but at the same time I always try to find like what I call my money question and I started doing this around like when I started covering the Harry Potter movies it's like I had gone into the flow of my interviewing like style and figuring out and being more comfortable that I then there was I forgot what it was but there was I remember there was one Harry Potter movie I asked a really good question and I liked the way it felt and the reaction that I got from it that I was like it was such a money question so from then on I always find one question per movie that's like I I really feel like no one else is going to ask and it'll be uh-huh. something where it's like a theme of the movie relating it to them in real life or something creative yeah yeah that's cool I, I kind of like, you know, watching Hot Wings or something where he tries to dig deep into people's back background yeah. and stuff. So it's kind of <laughs> cool. It's kind of cool. I love Sean. So we, we just talked about you did Bullet Train with Brad Pitt just recently. And that was the first time talking to him on, on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy. I actually also interviewed Angelina Jolie for the first time this year, too. Unfortunately, on Zoom, not in person. But those were two really big actors who I had not yet interviewed. Yeah. But yeah, Brad was great. He was playful and silly and fun. That's always, That always makes it easy, right? When they're playing along. Yes. Them. So let's see. Who do you, else do you have on your bucket list? Okay. So yeah, I looked I looked up like a list of all of the like, top actors before this interview because I wanted to know who I haven't yet interviewed. There are only three. So it's Johnny Depp. Jennifer Aniston and Robert Downey Jr. Really? For whatever reason, because with Marvel movies, they never give one person, unless you're like E! News or Entertainment Tonight, they never give the reporters the entire cast. So what they would do is like, if it's an Avengers movie, they would say, you could choose. Would you rather have Chris Hemsworth and Chris Evans or Mark Ruffalo and <laughs> Robert Downey Jr.? And we would just, we would, you would figure out like, I just never ended up getting RDJ. Uh, so I haven't interviewed him and I haven't interviewed Jennifer Aniston, which is also weird. She and hasn't Johnny, done a whole lot lately though. Yeah. And then Johnny Depp, I was supposed to interview Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie for this, for the movie, the tourist. Okay. I passed on it because it was my, it was my birthday. I was young. I wanted to like have this big party with my friends and my boyfriend at the time. And I just, I really wanted to go home. I was already in London for Chronicles of Narnia and we were supposed to take the train to Paris for the tourists, but I just really wanted to go home for like, I was just really young and that was more important to me. So (laughs) I passed on those interviews thinking I can, I'll interview Johnny Depp and Angelina Angelina another time. Like I do so many of these interviews. Went home, the party sucked. My boyfriend ended up like cheating on me. Like he was like, it was just like, it was so, it wasn't even like a good party. And then I never got a chance to interview Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie again. So for the last over a decade, Uh I've always regretted turning down a work opportunity for partying or for a boy or something. Um, So Uh I never did ever again. So hmm. I always choose work first and I only finally just interviewed Angelina Jolie for the first time this year, but I still have not interviewed Johnny Depp. Well, he's making a little bit of a comeback, so you might you True, he was just the moon man at the MTV Video Music Awards. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. So uh, do you have an interview that's particularly memorable, either good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> 
I've never had a really bad interview, thank God. Uh-huh. Um, I know that's like everyone always likes to ask me that, like, who's the worst person to interview? <laughs> but there isn't really I've never had a bad experience. And I I think that's a good thing because some people have had bad experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, the coolest interview, just being in front of Oprah Winfrey or uh, Beyonce was like yeah amazing Beyonce I remember I was it was for dream girls I was pretty new I it still was only like with underneath like my like first 10 interviews so I was I remember feeling like kind of nervous and I had like butterflies and I was like a little shaky and she like helped me through like I remember I stumbled over a question and Mm -hmm. she was like it's okay like just start over and she was like helping me through it or there was like what fool's gold which is Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson had done the entire interview and then like later in the day they were like oh my god we just realized we weren't recording the entire time (laughs) and so i had to go back in and do it over again but i hadn't but i had a lot of like one-off moments that weren't planned that was really good and matthew mcconaughey and kate hudson straight up had remembered the interview so they were like and then you said this (laughs) <laughs> and then they're like, do this and say this. And so then I like, pre- so they were like directing me and I was like, acting <laughs> out the funny yeah. moment that we had had. And then yeah. they would like pretend like they were responding back and like say something funny. And so it was, that was really cool of them. Yeah. I mean, that's what they do, right? They're actors. They, you exactly. know, they, it can be the first time or the yeah. seventh time. It'll sound or like I it. spoke whale with Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. For finding Dory. That was pretty fun. <laughs> now, do you, you, I've seen you do some some interesting things. You know, you'll do virtual reality, you'll voiceover, mm-hmm. Olaf or something. Do you come up with those or are those someone, someone's hands you that and said, hey, we'd like you to do this? Yeah, no, that's actually part of like covering. It would be for the home entertainment release. So it's for when the DVD comes out. Disney or whatever studio will have reporters do these like fun activities that again get packaged with your overall segment. And so it'll be like for Frozen, they'll say like, hey, come into the studio and you get to see where the actors actually like recorded their lines and they they give you a whole like tour and show you like the storyboards and and you get to talk to the below the line filmmakers and so they have you like do ADR over a scene to kind of just like splice in with uh the rest of your your footage and your interviews and stuff just to make it like a fun package we are on one of the actual sets used in the filming of the Lego movie it's going to feel like I'm in zero gravity. You got it. Feel how your heels brought you over? Yeah, the girl. Yeah. Hey, it's lunch time. <laughs> Let's go to lunch, guys. Yeah, Wait, bye-bye. Okay, Let's go, Kurt. Come on. We are at the Augmented Reality on, Experience guy. at the Natural History Museum on, of Los Angeles. Guy. I'm here with John Leguizamo. We are kicking so We're having a coffee. blast. And who's the funky-looking donkey over there? That's Sven. Uh-huh. And who's the reindeer? Sven. I like you, too. That was so hard, especially that last one, because there's so much to say. And you literally have to match the animation, which is not how they normally do it. But that was hard. Was it good? I'm not joking. That's actually the best anyone's ever. Is there anything that you've said no to that you said, I'm not doing that? (laughs) Yes, there was one time. (laughs) There was one. And it was also because I was first starting out. Um, it, it, again, I think maybe with my, my first year or two of like hosting and I was really young, um, we did an animal training episode where they (laughs) wanted me to kiss a seal. Like I had to like stand there and the seal had to like come up and like kiss my face. And for whatever reason, I just was not having a good day. I think maybe I, cause I was in college again, I was telling you guys, um, I think maybe I was a little hungover. (laughs) (laughs) I just remember being like, not in a mood for a seal to kiss me and I would not do it. And my, Mm. my producer was not like happy that I wouldn't do it, but that was the only time. Any other thing I've done now, I've yeah. always said yes to. So like go skydiving. Didn't really want to do that. Did it <laughs> mm-hmm, like a mm-hmm. bunch of things like stunts. And I'm always down for the stunts, but like skydiving, it wasn't my first time. And I got really sick the first time I did it. Uh-huh. So I went into it knowing ugh, like I'm going to have nausea like for the rest of the day, but I had to do it for the camera. So uh-huh. now I always say yes to everything now. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then your uh, your daily job is with Yahoo, mm. and you're doing Last Night Now, which um, is basically you 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 watch or or does someone hand you the material or how do you how do you get in so much TV watching and, and be able to summarize something in like two minutes? I know it's hard. 
Um, I have a team. So it's myself. I have two other producer slash writers. I'm, I'm the host of the entire show, but I'm also producer writer. And then we have one person who's an editor, one guy who is specifically clipping all of the things that mm. like the videos that we want for our video or script. And then we have like an overall supervising producer. So we put out three stories a night. So it's myself, a guy named George and Steve, and we are watching all of the programming. We're watching on the East Coast feed. So mm -hmm. shows like, for example, tonight I have to watch America's Got Talent wouldn't normally air 8 p.m. here Pacific Standard Time. But since we're watching East Coast, we start watching at five. So we work from like five to midnight, whereas if this job were on the East Coast, it would be like 8 p.m. to three in the morning. So that's why yeah. it's, it's based here in L.A. So that way we have that like three hour advantage. So um, George, Steve and I are watching all the programming. We're searching for the biggest breakout moments, things that are newsworthy for people to read the next morning who were sleeping. Um, and yeah, so for example, like tonight I'm watching America's Got Talent and I'll watch the entire two hour episode and try to figure out what the highlight moment is or if there's a lead there. So <laughs> then I start writing a script. So I have to pull clips. I think about like our our videos are generally like we start with an opening clip. Then I open the show saying, um, OK, last night on The Bachelorette, uh, this is what happened. Then we lead into another like max 15 second clip. So I make that video. And at this point, I know that I don't want to use more than like four or five clips because then it's going to be over two minutes. So I'll generally try to stick to like four video clips all under 15 seconds, keeping it just like really short things that I say leading into the next clip. I then go film it in my studio here <laughs> at home. Uh -huh. And then from then I take that footage, I send it off to my editor. He starts editing the video based off of like what I've notated in the script. And that's when I start writing the article because I also am a writer for Yahoo. So we have to fully publish our mm -hmm. videos and articles. So now I turn my script into an actual article form. Um, it's a little more flushed out. And then usually by the time I'm, I'm pretty much ready to publish, I just need to embed that video. My editor has my video ready. So we watch down the video, make sure it's all good. Yeah. And then I could publish it to yahoo.com. And that's what everyone sees the next morning. It's a whole process. It yeah. actually only takes me two hours. I'm pretty fast. And you, and so your your day is, is just watching, writing, producing. Yes. Is that is it a tip? Do you have a typical day or is it a little different every single day? It's pretty it's pretty similar each day. The only thing that changes is just is just the story. So it's the lead that's different. Yeah. But as far as the process of watching all the the shows, finding out what you're going to write about, then the whole publishing process, that's pretty much all the same. Sometimes it'll be an easy night for me today because America's Got Talent starts early. So I'll already be starting by like 7 p.m. I'll already start writing. But sometimes, for example, I may not find my story until Corden, which is like ends at 1030 at night. So I'm starting <laughs> at like 1030 and then I'm like working until one in the morning. So yeah. it just depends. Yeah, yeah. And then I usually I have network during the day sometimes too on top of it. So I'll double up. Do you, do you ever get tired of it? You ever say, oh, I got to watch America's Got Talent again? No, or, I love yeah? my job. Yeah. Yeah. It took it sounds me like so long to get to where I am today that I'm, I'm just like so grateful and I'm so appreciative of all the opportunities because it wasn't easy for me. So yeah. being where I am today is something like a, when this all kind of like 2016 was kind of when my career, I feel like really started taking off and I was starting to like make money to be able like, you know, in the beginning for the first 10 years, I wasn't really making that much money to be able to support like an, myself on my own. So 2016, when I started working at complex on top of made in Hollywood was really when things started taking off. And I just remember driving to work every day, just being like a huge smile on my face alone in my car and just like <laughs> thanking like the universe for finally giving me the opportunity and like making me feel secure and that I didn't like, it wasn't a bad decision to, to take this route and to go back into like entertainment and stuff. And so, yeah. um, I just, I know how hard it is. And I, I know that so many of my host friends who don't have jobs right now and are looking for jobs. So I'm just thankful to be able to have so many like good opportunities that people would kill for it. Absolutely. 
made in Hollywood. So when you first auditioned for this movie, you had no idea that you were auditioning to be the first Asian American Marvel superhero with his very own origin film. Here's the thing, I had a little bit of an idea. Did it, you? They called it Untitled Marvel Project. Okay. All right, and then, and then I also knew that I was Asian. So I had, see, I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but putting <laughs> these two things together. There's a beautiful story here that, that interworks a lot of different themes and also perspectives, I think, of the Asian experience. There are also universal themes of like uh, this complicated relationship between a dad and son. So when I was watching it, I felt like it really authentically showed Chinese culture. There were characters that I don't want to give too much away that really reminded me of some of the things that I learned while growing up. Was that something that you wanted to bring to the film? Yeah, I I wrote this alongside one of our our co-writers, uh, Dave Dave Callahan, who is who is Chinese American, and it was just natural for us to throw ideas around that were rooted in our own shared experience. A lot of our our own personal experience made it made it into this movie. Everyone's going to watch this movie particularly children are going to finally feel like they're represented. Mm -hmm. um, it's so authentic to mm -hmm. Chinese culture. Yeah. Yes, Amen. snaps. Amen. Um, what does that mean to you? I mean, it means that kids will have what I never did growing yeah. up, you know, the, these these authentically portrayed super, you know, heroes and characters that really reflect a lived experience that is that is their own. I, f I think it means so much to be a part of a, of a movie like this, and especially it is the first of its kind. He's uh, the first um, Asian superhero in, in the Marvel Universe. I think for kids to be able to see a part of themselves, it just, it, it means a lot. So we're the Infatuation Podcast, so we, we talk about Asian stuff, and turns out that you happen to be Asian. Am I? <laughs> go figure, go figure. <laughs> And I, I feel like personally, I feel like the last year or two have been pretty exciting for, for Asian Americans. Um, I mean, we've seen, we just saw, what was it, last week we saw Simu Liu take over The Tonight Show. Yep. And we just saw Arden Cho launch her show this week. Mm -hmm. And I saw you do an interview with Joe Coy, and that was really kind of cool. Some of the stuff that he had to say yes. about, hey, America gets it. They just need to hear it. You know, we need to be out there. And of course, you did a junket with Shang Chi. But what have you seen changing in the industry? Is it is it exciting for you as well to see this happening? Yeah, I feel like it kind of really blew up with Crazy Rich Asians. Right. I think that right. was kind of the first big mainstream movie that people watched, and and I think it came at the right time because we were like craving a good rom com because we haven't mm -hmm. had good rom com since like Matthew McConaughey, Kate Hudson days. <laughs> So yeah, like yeah. because that was like an actually like good rom com that everyone wanted to go see it, even though it was an Asian cast that like maybe if that movie came out back in the day with like the Nancy Myers movies, maybe it wouldn't have done as well. But because we were all starred for a, a, like a great rom com, everyone went to go see it. And then they like realized how cool some of like the Asian culture is um that it opened people's eyes to it and that it, it made asian people cool mm -hmm. to some people yeah and yeah. and i feel like that's kind of like the big catalyst that started leading to more people saying okay like you guys are finally realizing that you actually like asian actors and the asian culture let's put out more mm -hmm. and then fresh off the boat and other uh, shows and movies that, and Shang-Chi now like that I don't think would have been able to be as successful prior to Crazy Rich Asians yeah, um, but yeah. I think that more people are wanting to like obviously our community we want to show uh, our representation more but also I think people are starting to accept it more though with COVID we kind of had a little setback <laughs> yeah 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 and I mean, and things are coming out of the East, you know, Korea, <laughs> K-dramas and K-pop taking yeah. over the world. So pretty exciting. Do you feel like it's been kind of an advantage? Like people recognize you because you're the only only Asian American host doing these junkets and stuff or? It's an advantage now. Yes, it wasn't an advantage before. It may have been a disadvantage before. Hmm. In recent years, since Crazy Rich Asians, I have been going out on more castings because they're looking for ethnicity, whereas I didn't have that before. Prior to, I would say, around the time of Crazy Rich Asians, and I don't know if this is the reason why, but prior to that, no. I never once had a casting where it was like for hosting, where it was like they want someone who is not white. Whereas now, specifically, I get emails from my agent saying they're looking for a reporter of ethnicity 
And so that's why I have the audition. Yeah. I've, I've heard they're getting hyper specific too, in a way where it's like, we want someone who's Chinese that speaks Mandarin, you know, with and speaks English with an accent. It's almost like it's the pendulum has swung so far where it's like <laughs> before it could have been like, oh, you're you're Japanese or you're Korean or you're Chinese. You can play quote unquote Asian number five or whatever. But now it's getting so specific where we want you to be Filipino that speaks Tagalog, you know, that this. So it's it's kind of difficult sometimes now. I did lose a job at AP because I don't speak Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Dad, why didn't you teach me? <laughs> you teach me Mandarin. Um, but no, I actually it has been more of an advantage where I'm I thought, oh, like I'm good because like for example at Yahoo, I have actually thought I'm in a good place because I'm young, I'm female, and I'm Asian. So like I don't see them wanting to fire me anytime soon just because for optics it looks good <laughs> yeah, to have yeah. a female who is also Asian. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like I need to start like using that more to my advantage now that I finally have it to like reach out to people being like, you don't have an Asian reporter. Here I am. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So uh, we're going to slide into the part of the interview where we do what's called the lightning round. Okay. And so I'm just going to shoot some questions at you. Let's see what you got here. I'm excited. Uh, so I, I've been following your Instagram a little bit. I've noticed you're a little bit of a sneaker head. <laughs> yes. Uh, ballpark. Do you have like a whole room of sneakers? Like ballpark, how many kicks do you have right now? I think that I probably am finally at, if not just over a hundred. <laughs> nice. And that includes, that's like all of them. And so like, I would say a lot of them are actually Adidas because when I first started out my sneaker collection, I actually was more into Adidas. Uh-huh. So I do have one designated closet in my house of the three closets. The biggest closet is in the office and that's my <laughs> sneaker closet. And so one half of the closet is Adidas and the other half is Nike and Jordan. And then in the middle is like our Yeezys. Um, I never, <laughs> I never use the Adidas side. I don't ever wear, and yeah. I have like some pretty good like NMDs and stuff from back in the day, but yeah, it's just like yeah. not my style right now. So I never go on that side. Um, but yeah, mostly Jordans. Yeah. So th- is that your go-to? If you had to go leave the house right now, you're going to grab a pair of dunks or what are you going to grab? Dunk clothes. Dunk clothes and Jordan one highs are my two go-to silhouettes. I don't like dunk highs and I don't love Jordan lows. I like the dunk lows and I like the Jordan one highs. Um, Though I still have all of them. It's just, I prefer dunk lows right now because it's summer. So I'm wearing shorts and I don't like wearing shorts with Jordan one highs. So I wear dunk lows. (laughs) It's a whole thing. There's a process. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So if I were to like (laughs) immediately run out right now, I got my Panda dunk lows Uh because those are kind of like my daily snakes just to like throw on. They go with everything. So that's the one pair of sneakers that I leave by the door. Everything else is in their shoe boxes in the closet. Yeah. And they're so freaking comfortable too. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Better than heels. Definitely. Right. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I, especially during quarantine, because we weren't going out, I would, I didn't wear heels for like two years that when I then <laughs> tried to put my heels on, I think that like my foot shape changed because it would not fit in the heel that I, that I have for sure worn pre COVID, but like I couldn't even make it 20 feet without being like, I cannot wear these. So I definitely have some like good heels that I can't wear anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, number two, do you, do you have a piece of memorabilia or something from a movie or an autograph that you uh, treasure more than any others? Uh, I don't have any autographs, but I I knew that you were going to ask this question. So I got it out so I can show you just in case you want to use this video. So I have this chessboard that was gifted to me for um, the Queen's Gambit, which is the Anya Taylor-Joy Netflix show. And so it was this really nice chessboard with like drawers and it has like the different chess pieces. And it says the Queen's Gambit on it right here, like engraved in gold. Everyone got one or, or just you? I think it was the the critics because it was given to me around award season. Every award uh-huh. season, because I'm a film and a TV critic, we get like gifts um, leading up to Critics' Choice Awards just to like promote the show or movie that they want to be nominated or voted for. And so this is just a really nice piece. And I was obsessed with Queen's Gambit. It was a really cool show. Um, yeah. yeah, it's so good. So when I got it, I was like, wow, this is so nice. So I actually usually have this displayed right underneath my TV in the entertainment center. It's like kind of really the only thing you see. And 
I just love it. It's beautiful. And then we end each interview by asking our guests to think of an infatuation. Um, An infatuation is anyone in the Asian community that has been an inspiration to you or that you admire. So Kylie Erica Marr, who is your infatuation? Okay, so I think I'm going to go with Olivia Munn because I do feel like her and I are somewhat similar in the paths that we took that we're both into hosting and acting. And I do feel like I may still want to go back into acting one day. It's mm-hmm. not something that I'm trying to like actively do right now, sure. but maybe I could. And I like how she was doing like, I think she also did junkets at some point, but she yeah. was hosting like a video game show. Like it was like a nerdy show. And then she eventually became like, what What was her character in X-Men? She was just like, she was so badass. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would love to eventually be in like a Marvel movie. So yeah, um, yeah I really like Olivia Munn. I love her career path. I actually met her manager once on an airplane. <laughs> we were sitting next to each other and he told me that. And I'm like, I'm trying to be like Olivia Munn. I love her <laughs> career path. Like I want yeah. that exact same career path. So yeah. yeah. And, and she's really cool. Like she's, she's proud of her Asian heritage. So mm-hmm. she'll, she'll bring her mom on, on screen sometimes. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that does it for episode 48. Thanks so much, Kylie, for coming along with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So everyone out there, make sure that you're watching Kylie on Last Night Now on Yahoo.com and Made in Hollywood. You can follow Kylie on Instagram or Twitter at Kylie Erica Marr. And her website is KylieEricaMarr.com. So we'll put all the information in the show notes, but... (laughs) Thanks for much, so much for giving us some of your time. I know you got to head off to work now and Maybe watch you. a little. Start watching America's Got Talent. Yeah. All right. So thanks so much. Keep in touch. If you have any uh, inside scoops, make sure you uh, we hear it here first. I will. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kylie. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.